Hey everybody, and welcome to this lecture from CyberMD. This lecture will cover the non-ANCA small vessel vasculitides. Please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our content so that we can continue to provide free medical education resources to students around the world. Let's get started. First, however, we're going to talk about the layers of the blood vessel wall as a quick hit on vascular anatomy to prime us for the lecture. The innermost layer of the vasculature is called the intima, which is made up of epithelial cells that rest on a basement membrane. Moving on to the middle layer of the vessel wall, known as the media, it is composed of smooth muscle cells. Finally, we have the outermost layer of the vessel wall, the adventitia, which is made up of connective tissue. Disruption of the intima can lead to thrombosis or the formation of blood clots due to the exposure of subendothelial collagen, which can obstruct blood flow and lead to tissue ischemia or oxygen deprivation. Additionally, chronic inflammation of the cells composing the vasculature may result in fibrosis, which may also lead to ischemia as the lumen of the vasculature narrows. Alright, let's get started. So first we're going to cover Hinox schonlein purpura or an IgA vasculitis. HSP is an immune complex mediated vasculitis that typically presents with a tetrad of symptoms. One, palpable purpura. Two, arthritis or arthralgias. Three, abdominal pain. And four, renal disease. It is characterized by the deposition of IgA immune complexes within the walls of small blood vessels. The exact pathogenesis of IgA vasculitis, or HSP, is unknown, but it is thought to be multifactorial. HSP is more common in children, with 90% of cases occurring in patients under the age of 10. It's more common in males than in females, and the peak incidence of HSP is around 6 years old. Now, the onset of HSP is typically going to be one to three weeks after an infection, most commonly an upper respiratory tract infection, uh, which is going to be caused by something like a group A streptococcus. Again, the classic tetrad of symptoms in HSP includes palpable purpura, an arthritis or an arthralgia, uh, abdominal pain, and renal disease. Uh, however, in any individual patient, only some of these symptoms may be present. The skin manifestations are present typically in 100% of these cases, uh, and that's going to include symmetrically distributed, raised, erythematous macules or urticarial lesions that coalesce, coalescing meaning they run into each other, so they coalesce into palpable purpura. The most common sites of skin involvement are going to include the lower extremities, the buttocks, and other areas of pressure or constraint, so think about like the waistline where clothes are um, cinching down on the waist. Joint involvement is going to be present in approximately 75% of cases, and typically that's going to be your arthritis or your arthralgia, uh, most commonly of your ankles and knees, so focusing again in on the lower extremities. Uh, your GI involvement occurs in approximately 60% of cases, uh, and it's going to be like this colicky abdominal pain. Uh, sometimes patients may even have this uh, it, to such a high degree that it's going to mimic what we call an acute abdomen. Uh, they may have bloody stools or melena. Uh, they may have nausea, vomiting, and this can actually cause intussusception. Uh, kidney involvement occurs in about half of cases, and that's going to occur as like a nephritis with signs and symptoms of nephritic syndrome. Uh, other organs such as the scrotum, uh, the peripheral nervous system, respiratory tract, eyes, these can also be involved, but those are lower yield for the exam. HSP is a clinical diagnosis, and lab tests are not essential to diagnosing HSP. However, they may be useful for excluding other diagnoses in your differential in the event that your patient is exhibiting only one or two of the typical symptoms. Uh, you may see increased anti-streptolysin O titers from their previous infection, uh, proteinuria, and hematuria as well. Again, this diagnosis is made clinically. Uh, histopathological examination is not required for the diagnosis of HSP, but may be useful in atypical cases to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, you would see a leukocytoclastic vasculitis with IgA dominant immune dep uh, deposition in small vessels of the skin and the kidneys and other infected organs. 
Uh, you may see some fibrinoid necrosis and small arterioles. Uh, there may be interstitial inflammation in the kidney as well. The treatment for HSP is essentially supportive care. Uh, it's a self-limited disease, and in most cases, it's going to resolve without you doing anything, uh, and it takes about four to six weeks. Uh, so again, supportive care aimed at controlling their symptoms and preventing complications. So that's going to include things like hydration, rest, uh, NSAIDs for their abdominal pain or their joint pain. Uh, you may even use topical corticosteroids if the abdominal pain uh, is really, really bad. Um, in really severe cases, glucocorticoids may be necessary in order to prevent any kind of renal damage by reducing that inflammation. Um, you can also use antihypertensive medication if these patients have hypertension, uh, severe hypertension associated with like renal involvement and renal damage. Uh, and very, very, very rarely, super low yield for your exam, uh, but severe cases, uh, immunosuppressive therapy may be considered. Um, so the prognosis of HSP is generally very good. Uh, most patients, again, recover within a month with no uh, help from you, the physician, just NSAIDs, rest, hydration, that kind of thing. Uh, however, the complications can occur, uh, and some of those complications can include like a nephrotic syndrome or the intussusception, which is displayed here on the screen. Uh, you may have some other kinds of like seizures if they're very febrile or hypertensive encephalopathy, uh, but those would be very rare complications for this disease. All right, moving on to cryoglobulinemic vasculitis. Cryoglobulinemic vasculitis is a systemic vasculitis, and it's going to be characterized by the presence of cryoglobulins in the blood vessels. Cryoglobulins are abnormal proteins that precipitate at a low temperature, which can cause the occlusion of small and medium-sized vessels. Uh, this type of vasculitis is pretty rare, but it's more common in middle-aged and elderly individuals, and the vast majority of the cases, especially on your exam, are going to be occurring in the setting of a patient who has a hepatitis C virus infection. So keep that in mind, that's a really high yield for this vasculitis. The clinical presentation of cryoglobulinemic vasculitis uh, varies pretty widely, uh, but most of the common symptoms include, uh, similar to HSP, uh, palpable purpura, your arthralgia, your fatigue. So the patient population really matters here, right? A uh, child versus a middle-aged adult with hepatitis C virus infection. Uh, the diagnosis of this vasculitis can be confirmed by the presence of cryoglobulin, uh, cryoglobulins excuse me, in the serum. Uh, again, these are these abnormal proteins that are precipitating at low temperatures, but dissolving at higher temperatures. Uh, you may get a cutaneous or renal biopsy, and that could help you confirm the diagnosis. Um, and then in the serum, you would also expect to see decreased complement levels, specifically C4, um, as well as elevated rheumatoid factor levels. But don't bank on the rheumatoid factor levels. Those are pretty nonspecific. Uh, again, diagnosis is clinical uh, as well as some relevant lab findings. Uh, so you're really going to want to make sure you take a thorough medical history on these patients. Um, and then the histologic findings are also going to have a leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Um, and that's going to be caused instead of IgA deposition in HSP uh, in cryoglobulinemic vasculitis. This is going to be caused by deposition of cryoglobulins. Um, and that can potentially lead to necrosis and occlusion of the blood vessels, which subsequently would cause tissue damage and organ dysfunction. Uh, the treatment for this disease depends on the severity of the disease. Uh, very mild cases can be treated with symptomatic treatment, such as NSAIDs. Uh, moderate or severe cases may require glucocorticoids in combination with either uh, cyclophosphamide or rituximab. Uh, but what's really important here is you're really going to want to treat the underlying etiology, which is probably going to be the hepatitis C virus infection. Uh, so make sure you're treating that uh, as well whenever you see these patients. Uh, complications of this disease can be pretty severe and life-threatening. Uh, they can include renal failure or uh, skin necrosis or peripheral neuropathy. Uh, so close monitoring and prompt, treat prompt treatment are pretty important in preventing complications in these patients. 
Uh, lastly, we have cutaneous small vessel or hypersensitive hypersensitivity vasculitis. Uh, this is pretty low yield for your exam, uh, but it is fair game, so something you should be aware of and should know. Cutaneous small vessel vasculitis is a necrotizing vasculitis of cutaneous small vessels, so skin small vessels, caused by immune complex deposition and involvement of organs other than the skin must be absent. So this is skin only. Uh, the etiology of this vasculitis is often idiopathic, uh, and that's accounting for about 45 to 55% of cases. However, all patients should be evaluated for potential underlying causes, uh, including autoimmune diseases like uh, systemic lupus, uh, as well as ANCA-associated vasculitides, HIV, hepatitis C, uh, as well as the use of certain drugs which can cause this condition. Uh, those drugs include penicillins, cephalosporins, sulfasalazines, hydralazine, PTU, allopurinol, phenytoin. Again, very low yield for you to know, but fair game. Uh, patients may also report flare triggers, uh, such as alcohol consumption or upper respiratory tract infections. Patients with this vasculitis usually present with painful, symmetric, non-blanching, palpable purpura on the lower limbs. Uh, other lesions, such as uh, subcutaneous nodules and ulcers or urticaria or vesicles may be present, but again, remember, these are all ta you're all talking about like a skin cutaneous surface here. Um, these lesions usually disappear in 7 to 10 days um, if it is a drug-induced exposure. Uh, to diagnose this vasculitis, you need a biopsy to confirm it. Uh, additional diagnostics should be requested to investigate the underlying etiology again and to rule out other systemic vasculitis. Um, so this is a diagnosis of exclusion for the most part, and the skin biopsy is going to really seal the deal on clinching this diagnosis, uh, and that biopsy is going to show that leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Management of this vasculitis depends on the severity and chronicity of the lesions. Uh, general principles include treating an underlying etiology, uh, as well as discontinuation of any drugs if you believe that the drug is the inciting event, and you should consider the need for immuno, uh, immunosuppressive therapy uh, depending on the severity and the chronicity. Uh, NSAIDs and bed rest, however, are usually going to be recommended as first line, and then glucocorticoids may be indicated uh, with severe or chronic or recurrent disease. So thanks for tuning in. Again, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our content so that we can continue to provide free medical education resources to students around the world. We really hope this helped. Thank you so much.